Well, hey, welcome back to Movie Community College. I am the Professor Jeremy Bowling. Welcome one and all, and I'm going to do a, uh, a movie review of a film. Um, it's an old film, and is this going to be in our Faith film uh, playlist? And it's The Passion of the Christ. Um, with Easter passing and Passover passing, uh, this film gets a lot of kind of retread because of the holiday. Um, this film, 2004 is when it came out. The budget on it was $30 million, which isn't a lot for the Hollywood kind of um, budget. And it did $611 million back in 2004. You're talking about ticket prices were a lot cheaper than they are now. The film is the number one R-rated film of all time. I think I think the order is uh, is the Passion of the Christ at number one. Number two, I think, is American Sniper, and number three is Deadpool. That's quite a quite a movie. Uh, the film was distributed by 20th Century Fox. It was produced by Mel Gibson. He uh, did the screenplay for it. And it was kind of, um, you know, he is a controversial character. You know, when he, 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 a lot of people don't know, but but because of so much time has passed, but he kind of got his start in the in the Road Warrior movies uh, that have been remade with Tom Hardy, and um, he um, did Lethal Weapon. He got into doing some film work behind the camera, and. Um, you know kind of put this film out here that just was really just a blockbuster this film was in Latin Hebrew and Aramaic subtitled um, and and if you said you know what we're gonna do a movie about Jesus we're going to not make it in English and we're going to we're going to roll it out with Mel Gibson directing it and producing it and working on the screenplay, boy, I, I I just think that it would be a complete disaster. Like no one would see it. It would end up being on you know TBN or some kind of uh, cheesy thing. Um, I think what sets this movie apart, number one, is the cinematography. The film is beautiful to watch. If you know anything about the storyline. You don't need the subtitles. You can kind of just watch and take it in. I like to watch films without subtitles to kind of see how much of the story is conveyed to me through the art of storytelling. Um, I think it's also a really good depiction of that time. And these, these films are so hard to do, the sword and sandal films, even if you make it biblical too on top of it. Because a lot of studios make this huge mistake of getting somebody my color skin right to play jesus and everybody looks at it and goes to <laughs> he's a, he's a white dude there were no white dudes over there well romans kind of but they, they were olive skinned right they're olive skinned typically i mean i suppose you mix with some spaniards or something you get an occasional but people were 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 hebrews they were arab looking they were brown skin and, and we saw jim caviezel who I think was incredible in the film playing Christ, he looked Jewish. His disciples looked Jewish. Um, Jim Cathiesel's performance as Jesus was the best that I've ever seen out of all the Jesus films that I've seen. And I've seen quite a few of them where you see some kind of portrayal of Christ in them. The Passion of the Christ the passion means the suffering so this is this film was focusing on kind of the last night of Christ in, in we we saw this this betrayal of the crucifixion which I think was the most accurate and graphic betrayal of the crucifixion of what he actually went through you know when you see some of the other movies and how they approach it it just it looks it it looks fake it looks phony it looks weird with some white dude with red paint red makeup you know smeared on his face and like it does not capture the feeling of what he went through and i think too christianity has enough problems uh with its perception of the outside world 
that when you throw a white Jesus in a movie that's really cheesy, it just doesn't help the cause. It just doesn't. It kind of sets things back to the skeptic's mind because they look at it and go, that, that looks kind of weird. I don't know. I don't know what to think of that. This film changed my life in 2004. I remember going to see it with the Warrior Queen. We were in a, it was, the line was wrapped around the movie theater. We were living in Scottsdale at the time. And uh, we were in like a two-hour line to go see this movie. And and I've always had a hard time fitting into the Christian realm. I mean, look at me. I wear a hat a lot of times. I, you know, shave my head. Uh, I rock T-shirts and hoodies and uh, jerseys. I love to wear dicky shorts. And I don't mean to turn this into a commentary on myself. But I've always had a hard time fitting in because when I was in line, what I saw were the, were the typical Christian men... Who just look sissified you know they look uh you know i think i think it was before we had the term met metrosexual they didn't look manly they were in penny loafers with no socks and you know dress shorts that were pleated you know uh and and i watched these really effeminate men lose their minds and snap on people because they were in line and they couldn't get tickets and i thought to myself at the time what a what a bizarre thing to see Right? Well, I mean, <laughs> so we got into the movie, we sat down in the movie, and um, there were screams where people just, scenes where people just screamed during the crucifixion, during the demon possession, during, I mean, where they just, the theater just screamed and erupted. And um, I just sobbed and cried at this film. It still has an effect on me. When you think about the totality of what this man did and what he went through. And how I loved how they portrayed him in the beginning of the film. Struggling. He knows the Father's will. He doesn't want to do the Father's will. I mean, his body doesn't want to do it. He's trying. Is there any way around this? Is there any way that we can accomplish what you want to, God? without this thing happening and we see satan who was played by a woman which is kind of interesting and and satan is overseeing this 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 temptation in the garden of gethsemane and that serpent kind of comes out from underneath the robe and is working its way towards satan it's an ad or very poisonous if it kills him if it kills christ it you know this thing is over and Christ is praying and praying and he's struggling and he's praying and all of a sudden he realizes what he's doing. Once he gets once he gets the wills aligned, you know, once he kind of gets his ideology aligned here, he's ready to go and he hits it. Right? He steps up and he's 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 of the mindset I'm going through this, I'm gonna carry this out to the end and nothing's going to stop me. And we see him get up and he smashes that serpent on the head, throwing back to the book of Genesis. I mean, it's prophecy. It's in the book of Genesis of that scene. And you just see the, the events unfold. Um, the film is really, really good. The film draws on Hebrew stories, the Bible, the New Testament. You can find some Midrash in there. You can find some, some Josephus' writings are in there. And one of the things that you see when you watch the movie, if you, if you don't know kind of the storyline, is Pontius Pilate is struggling on whether or not he should have participated in this. And what people don't know is it's believed that Pontius Pilate's wife, they had a child, and that child got sick and died, and Christ raised that child from the dead. So the legend goes. And then Pontius Pilate's wife becomes a follower and supporter financially of Jesus' ministry and his ongoing here. And so when she comes to Pilate and says, he is a holy man, have nothing to do with his death, it's because she has some special insight. That dream that was given to her is because of her affiliation with him and his disciples and the believers. At that same time, Pontius Pilate had horrendous luck with the Jews horrendous Caesar told him 
This is twice we've had rebellions that got out of control and people died. If there's one more, if there is one more, it will be your blood. Okay, do you understand me? This is it. And and so Pontius Pilate is in a rock and hard place, really. And it, and and I think you know to the believer watching this, what do you, you know? What do you do with situations where where there is no easy choice? If you choose right, you're going to pay. I th I think, and this is easier said than done, obviously. But I think you always do what's right, and you leave the consequences to God. Right? I think that's the easiest way to kind of kind of get through the moral gray areas is to do it that way. Another thing that has happened in historical, allegedly historical, is is Pontius Pilate has to give an account to Caesar out of what has happened here. And he writes a letter, and I've read the letter, you can find it online, it's supposedly under lock and key at the Vatican. And it's and it's a great response to what he witnessed and what he went through. And it almost gives you the impression that before he died, he became a believer. Not sure, but that kind of gives you that impression. That's something I think worth um, checking into if, if you've enjoyed this movie. The portrayal of Jesus by Jim Cathiesel. I mean, it's been 12 years. And he's still, I think, the, the pinnacle of Christ. Right when I think of Christ, I think of Jim Cathedral's portrayal. You know, um, an incredible movie. Really, really is an incredible movie. It's really too bad that I think Mel Gibson got drunk and got got caught with his anti-Semite comments. People shouldn't be surprised. It's kind of the view of the Catholic Church. He's just spouting the Catholic Church's point of view, really. Um, my final grade on this movie is is an easy A plus, right? This movie is if we were if we were grading on the bell curve, this movie is such a high. It's not just at a hundred percent. It would be the kind of movie that goes at a hundred and forty percent. So it moves everything up the bell curve, especially within the faith film. Every faith based film that I go and see, I measure against the passion of the Christ. I look for story. I look for continuity. I look for uh, cinematography. I look for, especially if you're going to do swords and sandals, how does it look? How do they sound? You know, the closest, uh, you know, the closest thing that I've seen to this, and it was, and it was, isn't as good, was um, the Tribune. I think that's what it was called, the Tribune. Um, anyways, let me ask you this. You're watching this review. Um, what is your favorite faith-based film? This is my my favorite film. Because if these events aren't true, I mean, first of all, it's done outstandingly, but if these events aren't true, then the whole thing is, is just, a, a, just a, a sham and a mockery, a sham mockery, if you will. And Paul is right, then we should be pitied for believing this. You know, everybody else is enjoying themselves, and here we are trying to do something different. Anyway, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on what you think is the best faith-based film. And it doesn't have to be Christian either. I mean, you can tell me about an Islam film or a Hindi film, and I'll go check it out um, and take a look at it. I'd like to thank you so much for checking out this video. Um, I, I hope everybody had a safe Easter, safe holiday, Holly, if you're in India, around the same time. And um, we'll catch you next time. Peace and God bless.